Hello, good uh, good day, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure today to to be with you, and especially to have this conversation with my my old friend Chris Deacon. I don't know exactly what we're going to wrap about, but there's so many subjects uh, that we're interested in, and I guess we are going to try and concentrate, even if. This is not that easy and it's unfeasible on, on the diffusion, whatever that is, of, uh, of the so-called African art in, in the world, in Africa, in the global market, and to, to see what are the good ideas, what are the, 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 the interesting initiatives that are taking place, interesting project. Um, as something, for instance, interesting for me, I didn't necessarily know that uh, the Guggenheim uh, in Abu Dhabi has purchased two two big um, installations by Pascal Martin Tayu, and that Pascal Martin Tayu is in a lot of collections of uh, of the region, and uh, so that there, there's a lot of things that we might not know that it's a region that is still a bit uh, unknown to me. I, I know Chris, you, you know the region. We, we, we've met in Dubai and in a couple of places uh, along the years. You've been here quite uh, often. Chris? I've, been, I've been many times there, but I, uh, when you do your introduction, as you did it right now, uh, can I ask you a question? Are you still talking about African art? Because I had many discussions about this with uh, my mentors. I mean, you are one of my mentors. Uh, I have four men and four women who are my yes. mentors. I, mean, I, 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 I know those people. I, um, I will no, tell you, I I mean, will tell you who they are. I mean, it's of course Stuart Hall, who was with us at the International yeah. Institute for Visual Arts. It's uh, of course Salah Hassan, with whom I worked a lot. And it's of course my successor in Munich. It's uh, Okay. Okay. But not just men. I mean, when I think about yeah. mentors, I have to call up uh, four woman names who are equally important. Uh, our little sister, Koyo Koyo, of course. But there is also Marie-Cécile Zanzou, who is a famous uh, collector uh, in Africa and in France. There is Anna Alix Kofi and, of course, Ngone Fall. I'm saying this because with all of them, I had always discussions. And also with you, can we still speak about African art? Sometimes I wonder, you know? No, uh, the very point, of course, you know, all the discussions we, we had about it and the, the answer was no. And uh, in that very case, of course, we're using it as a tool. We know that there's no such a thing as African art. Africa is a continent, it's not a country. And uh, the example I tend to take every now and then, even if uh, one could assume that in a country, within the same country, there's a communality of history. I always take the example of South Africa. We say, could one say there's a South African art when we had two different histories within the same country? So it's just, uh, a facility for for our audience etc to to say art coming from africa instead of uh, uh, that's why i always think quote unquote because if not i know that you and i we, we could spend four hours <laughs> just on that topic of is there an african art or not uh, so let's say but it's long but let's say that for the sake of it art coming from africa or, or art produced by African artists, because even there, we would have to define what is an African artist, what is art coming from Africa. Is somebody who was born in Africa, living in, in Ghent or in Paris or in New York, is he still an African? How do we call it? And I think that this is precisely um, one of the, the problems when people are dealing with this, that the art coming from there is that they don't know how to name it. And they always need to nail it. And by nailing it, it's, uh, it enters a box. Because when you nail something for facilities, it enters a box. I remember times back to the days when people were seeking for authenticity. Uh, and I was like, I'm sorry. I mean, people would tell me that when I would introduce myself as an African, I said, you're not authentic, you're not a real African. I would say, well, what is a real African? I and I remember, and, and I'll just finish that and let, let, let you go on. And I remember that the, the, one of the reasons why I did Africa Remix was to tell to people there's no such a thing as Africa. I mean, the whole world is living in a remix, but then this, it is gone, finished.
But what's interesting is that when you when you think historically in the present, to quote Okrian Weiser, yeah. that uh, for the first time, I think we start to have a kind of overview of what happened. I mean, think of, you know, it started in the 30s and the 40s with uh, La Negritude of uh, Van Gogh. Then we talked about Pan-Africanism. Then we talked about suddenly Afrocentricism. And then we had in 2007, we had Achille Mbembe's Afropolitanism. And then we had in Paris, we talked about uh, plural modernities. Uh, mm -hmm. There is the African hype. And then you have all these offsprings, Afrofuturism and yes. call it, call it. It's so interesting. It's so interesting that I think for the first time, and it coincides with a kind of African hype in the sense that I think things become normal. There is a thriving art market. There are museums which are being in construction in Africa. It's coinciding with this kind of normalization beyond developed uh, developmentalism, uh, beyond everything that we start to have finally an overview in what happened and what's going on. Do you agree with that? I think the battlegrounds we left behind. For me, the last battleground, which I, I still think is an actual battleground, and it's very, very, very important, is uh, to quote Salah Hassan, is Afropolitanism the right answer to the question? Personally, I don't think anymore, because I remember when we started to buy art from Africa for Tate Modern, that we could buy the artworks, but we could not welcome and host the artist. I mean, the diaspora is there, but our borders are closed. And I think that's also very typical, you know, that we are talking about artworks and not about human beings. I mean, that's, that's for me something which is completely, completely crazy. And when I was talking about Afropolitanism, it depended on if you were putting the accent on Africa or cosmopolitanism, but it's it's still a major, major issue, right? I think that precisely when you were uh, addressing the issue of normalization, I think that we're not into a normalization moment precisely uh, because things are detached. You have pieces in museum, but you don't have the people who produce them. Even if we go historically speaking, how many times you and I, we, we made projects where artists couldn't come from the continent because they didn't have the visa, they didn't have this, this and that. So I think that all those things go together. And I wouldn't talk about um, um, Afropolitanism uh, because uh, I guess what Ashil was saying is that the, contemporary Africa is made in the city. But I don't think it is cosmopolitanism. You and me, we can tour the world. How many people, not only in Africa actually, how many people can tour the world as they want to tour the world? So I think that uh, the politanism and the, the Afropolitanism is about the cities, not about the kind of a cosmos. But personally, I, I tend to hate the Afro things. I'm sick of the Afro things. Why don't we talk about futurism? I don't think that uh, the Afrofuturism and the people who started with it, started with it in the United States. They were not Africans, they were specialists in that, that, that. And they put it there. I don't know if they knew about the Italian futurism and what it meant then in the beginning of the, the century where they had a kind of a fascist that I did. But uh, yeah, they used Sun Ra and they were talking, I guess they wanted to talk about something like science fiction. They used futurism as if uh, there was no future in Africa when I think that it's the most uh, futuristic uh, continent and doesn't need to have an Afro attached. So I think we, we're far from normalization because there's a couple, you, you, you quoted the mentors, uh, you're part of them, there are more and more players who are reflecting uh, the right way on this phenomenon. But those players are fighting and you, you, you're part of them and you know that things are not given and that at times you have to knock the door for things to be normal. I think that unfortunately there are very few people but much more than 20 years ago, very few people are dealing with modernity and normality. Mm -hmm. 
on that matter. Can I come back to Afrofuturism, which I'm yeah. very interested in, because I got confronted uh, by this phenomenon for the first time by a specialist, uh, Alan Gallagher, who works with Afrofuturism way before many other people. And when I came across the exhibition in South Africa at the Goethe Institute in Johannesburg called Afrofuturism, I got to speak to many of the artists and we have to watch out because I think a fantastic thing is that when we speak about the artist, we have to talk in Africa, which I'm really happy about, not just visual artists, but also designers, photographers, theater makers, writers, film people. But when I spoke to them, they were saying to me, well, this is a very, very, very lucid strategy because look, they said to me, we don't have an immediate future. We want to look in what we can do in 25 years and in 50 years. And so they had a very, very concise, okay, but very clear idea about futurism. It was almost like they were asking to develop a time machine which could project them in the future. And I see a lot of the art, a lot of the art, and that's the reason why I'm so happy that you called your presentation the day after, that a lot of artists in Africa, in the African region, uh, but also artists working in the diaspora, that they are really thinking beyond today and they project themselves in the future. And I think if there is a keen aspect, is there a clear unique, I hate the word, but unique aspect, it's, it's this, it's like, what is my art telling about the future? Interestingly enough, our artists in Europe, so to speak, when you think about the big painters, they speak about the past, they speak about the wow. past, and African artists are dealing with something which is very, very difficult, which is a jump in the future, and that I find absolutely fascinating. I mean, that's even the way I saw the work of uh, somebody like uh, Kiyoma Ibinama, which work I adore, you know. That, is that something typical, you think? Or, or is, is, is it something you are not interested in? No, I mean, I, I'm not interested in Afrofuturism. I'm interested in the day after. And I think that a lot of region in the world is not, um, is not uh, special or particular to Africa. Africa is dealing with it in another way. I would say when we talk about Africa, to make long story so short, it's 60 years old. And Africa was trapped and Africans into how to reconcile with the past how to fill the gaps with the past that was partly erased, how to deal with what is happening now. And the whole thing was, how do we think tomorrow? Because all this, I mean, the now, the post-independence uh, uh, period or the, the, the independence period where the past, even the now was already a past because there were so many things to structure. The real fight is tomorrow, is the day after. When we're done with dictatorship, when we're done with the heritage of colonialism, when we're done with this, this and that, how do we invent the world? And uh, I guess it's not an accident, even if the, 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 the so-called leader do nothing about it, but I don't care about the leaders. It's not an accident if this continent is the youngest in the world. So a young continent full of kids, what can they do? They're not going to deal with the past forever. They have to invent their future because the future is now. And if they don't invent it, I mean, this is their day after. We are done, we, we, we finished. So if they don't come up, I mean, so it's something that is more than conceptual. It's a survival strategy. If they don't do it, they die. And I think this is what is so powerful and so, uh, uh, so interesting. There, there was this slogan, I think, during May 60, 68. Uh, uh, there was this slogan saying, you have no chance, grab it. And I think that this is what is happening. All those commentators say that there's no future in Africa. You have no future, grab it. And this is what they've been inventing uh, for, for the past 10 years. And this is why they're coming uh, so strongly. It's not that the market, this has always been my, my theory, it's not the market that is opening to them. It's them forcing the market's door. 
Wow, there's some people like you, me, and others who are helping. But if there was nobody, if there's no army, <laughs> there's no war. But it's because there's a bunch of kids out there who are producing things that we can show, that we can talk about, that the market is forced to, to open the doors. But it's them doing the job. When, when I speak about normal, what I wanted to say is that what I see happening right now is that there are more and more local correct collectors and not just in Nigeria where there have always been local collectors and not just in South Africa where there were some local collectors but I see I see that as a very 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 important point because uh, our friend Syndica Dokolo who died recently he was one of the first for me entrepreneurs who took this whole idea of collecting on a local scale with all the good and the bad things which are attached to is incredibly serious. And what he also did, what was unique, and I think there we still have to train the African collectors, is that you have also, because of this concept of the future, which is connected in one way or another to the past, you have a unique chance to work with objects of today, of tomorrow, but also ancient objects. And I think that Syndica, what he did there was absolutely, for him, it was crucial to do both, to collect ancient objects, to talk about restitution of objects and to collect and even promote and even commission the contemporary. But in any case, I see, I see, I see things happening more and more and more. And I'm so glad that we now go beyond beyond this whole idea of developmentalism, which I think was necessary at some point. I'm talking about uh, the Prince Klaus Fund. I'm talking about other initiatives, but that we finally can go beyond this. And an exhibition, which was of course, absolutely crucial for that, which was an exhibition, I think, which happened uh, two years ago, Prête moi ton rêve, uh, Give me your dream, which was an exhibition locally produced with African artists touring in Africa. We see many, many more museums opening. And so I think that is a very, 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 very important thing right now. And that's the reason why uh, an art fair like Abu Dhabi giving you the chance to tell your story and your vision is also crucial because one of the new aspects which I found out in talking to Salah Hassan and Hor Al-Kazimi of the Africa Art Institute is that suddenly we are talking about something which is quite new, which is about relationships, Afro-Arabist relationships, which is quite new because we in Europe, we considered always the Middle East that's our terrain when you think about the Louvre Abu Dhabi. But in doing that, they break something open, which has been a long time a taboo. So on many levels, whether it be in terms of thinking, whether it be in terms of uh, giving a kind of intellectual clout, uh, building theory, uh, curatorship uh, commercially, things are definitely happening right now and, and very, very rapidly. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, of course, when I was invited, I found that very, very interesting and very challenging. I think that we're living in a time of, of many shifts. We're living in a time that I would call a time of chaos. But chaos, in a good sense of it, I love chaos. It's just that when the, the old lines are getting uh, being broken, uh, Europe uh, considered Africa as its property with a, a direct line to deal with things, et cetera, et cetera. That's why all these development programs were, were taking place. In the same time, Europe, I think, considered the Middle East as part of his, his things. So what, what I find funny in this, in this chaos, where, like the primal chaos when the world is being reorganized, uh, is that by showing interest uh, towards Africa, I think that the Middle East is, is setting itself free. It's not under the influence of Europe. I think they've always been, at least culturally, a kind of a little 
complex, like we want to be so much as the European way. And I think that we're living in an interesting time now when everybody can play a role to break these old lines, these old trade routes, where when you're here, you're going necessarily there, when you're there. And this shift is, is what is going to bring a, a big change, not only in the way people approach things. When I discuss with my friends from the Middle East for forever, the discussion we were having were the same discussion that the African countries were having. How do we deal with the past? How do we model ourselves? How do we create an identity that is ours and that is not borrowed? I mean, these are the questions all those uh, countries share. And there's a, a place, a seat, a huge vacuum for a dialogue. So I find interesting those, those new connections taking place in this in this region. And I think it can it can broaden the perspective, the market perspective, of course, but also the intellectual approach of all these questions of identity, market, modernity, etc. But now that we went beyond the categories of la negritude, pan-Africanism, Africanism, or even Afropolitanism, we are going beyond that, even beyond, because rightly so, you deconstructed the very word Afrofuturism. We also know that plural modernities is not the thing to look for. Yeah. But I think what we have to do is going also beyond what I call the propaganda machine. Uh, yeah. And uh, we need curators, we need theorists, we need critics who are going to tell themselves and us, this is an important work, this is an important initiative, and I'm going to tell you why. And this is not important and this is not necessary. And when I think about my mentors, uh, Hall, uh, you, uh, uh, Salah, but, but of course, Okwi and Anna Lix Kofi and Koyo, they always have been doing that. And I hope there will be a generation looking up to these aunts and uncles or mothers and fathers and saying what they, what they, what they had was a, a set I'm sorry to use this word because it sounds so moralistic, a set of judgments. This is an important work. This is an important contribution. And I'm still lacking that. No, I, it's only, not only this is an important work, it's the why. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm running a, a workshop called uh, at work, no, it's not the at work. Yeah, it's at work. And it's just about developing uh, critical uh, gaze and critical uh, thinking towards young people. They're not necessarily artists. They might be this, this, and that. But you know very well because you you were one of the guests of these master classes in photography. That if we're working with the youth. It was precisely because they need to be prepared. It's one thing to say that Africa is the youngest continent, etc. So what are the tools that are given to that youth? And I think the most important in the battle, and I totally agree with you, uh, is to give them the tools to tell their own story, to be able to spell this I. This I that not be my I, because it's not the same generation, we didn't do the same thing, but that I that will be able for them not to be defined, but to define themselves. I don't care about the right or the wrong. I care about somebody expressing himself in its own term. That's how we can start a discussion. But if there's no addition um, intellectual position, yeah? You're still thinking about that? Because when I have students uh, when I'm teaching and, they, and I ask them, why do you make art? And when they say to me, I want to express myself, then I say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't need you. I want you to maybe think a little bit more ambitious. I mean, there I, I disagree with you because I remember when we were teaching together the masterclass of photography in so many different cities in Africa, you were one of the most severe critics. I mean, you always... Absolutely. No, I mean, we, we agree, you disagree on an agreement. When I say to express yourself, is everybody can express himself, of course. Who, who cares about somebody saying I'm starving, etc. Uh, what I meant is, of course, with a distance, with a critical distance, is to go beyond, not to send a message, another expression. All the language is so, so trapped, but to send something that is built, that is constructed, and that knows uh, what are the consequences? 
that doesn't know all the consequences, but that is sending something to make noise. Uh, you, you don't wake up one morning and do something if it's not to break something. So this is what I meant by expressing oneself. It does not to say I'm an artist. It say, what am I producing that is going to break the tranquility of the world? And that world, and this is what I would tell them, start with your dad and your mom. Don't, don't think of breaking the Berlin Wall or to break the, 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 the Texas Wall. Start by breaking that wall here at home. And if you succeed, you might certainly break the other walls. But that's you have to find something to, to change the, the, the situation. That's what I saw also in the selection of Maya El Khalil, where she worked with three emerging young artists from the Emirates that uh, two of them, they were breaking down these taboos, you know, they were breaking down their own borders. So is that what you call going beyond self-expression? It's, it's a way to bring a stronger or a louder uh, or a more needed message? I think that somebody say, I am, uh, it's not enough to say I am, and I guess this is what we call the contemporary factor. To say I am, it means I know where I am. I know what is happening in the United States. I know what is happening in my country. I know what is happening everywhere. This is what I mean by being contemporary. It's not enough to be living now. Is to take on board all the issues that are surrounding us and to be plugged in. And when you do the work, again, you want to break walls. And I think, yes, those, those, those three girls were, uh, were, were interesting because they were rediscussing the establishment. And, and it was nice even to see their, their background, the three backgrounds. Uh, one of them used to be a hairdresser. All of a sudden, she started to, to think about, about hair. And she started probably to use or to think of a material. Nobody, if she would have attended uh, an art school in, in, uh, in Abu Dhabi, nobody would have told her you can use yeah. hair. Nobody would have told her about an message, et cetera, et cetera. But this is what I like. The, the fact that when you say, I am, you must change something because we're all different. So we cannot say I am just to say, I am part of this or part of that. I am means I'm part of nothing and part of everything at the same time. So how do you tell it? How do you express it so that I can hear it? So that who Hanru can hear it? So that uh, uh, Paolo Casals can, can hear it? Because this is something constitutive of, of contemporaneity. We speak the same language, but what is nice is that we don't have the same accents. And those accents are, are crucial to the music and the balance of the world. Let me, let me throw something else in. That is, um, you speak about contemporaneity, which I think is a very, very important concept. I see, I see a lot of visual arts in general, in Europe, but also in Africa and in China which I don't think is necessary because it has nothing to do with good intentions. It has to do with the fact that visual art as a discipline is becoming almost like a soup, like a sponge, which need to be constantly wet. But you know, when a sponge is being kept wet, it doesn't soak up anything anymore. It doesn't get wet. You cannot use it anymore. So in a way, all these youth, women, and men in the Gulf, in Africa, in Europe, everywhere, they are doing what they call, they are practitioners of visual arts. But sometimes I think that, that other disciplines might be more precise. I mean, might be more contemporary. And that's something which I think also we have to put forward as a question in the region. That is why visual arts and some young women in the Gulf, I mean, uh, the emergent artists who we spoke about, they also do it because they need their psychological space, but it's not just enough. So sometimes I question, and I'm now going back indeed to negritude, to Pan-Africanism, which for me the most important is that there were no borders between disciplines. And I think if Africa can be very good about doing that jump in the future, it's also because there we still have the possibility to mix disciplines. And even Okwi was doing that. Okwi made in the Vitra in Basel, he made an exhibition making Africa because Okwi 
didn't make a difference between architecture, visual arts, and industrial design, and and especially literature. Is is that something which is something else which youth in Africa should be looking for to ask the question: Is this the right discipline for me, or is it because visual arts, Simon, is a very weak discipline which can soak up everything and everybody? No, I mean uh, visual art is certainly apparently an easy thing when you don't think about what it is but uh, but of course the, 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 to, 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 to destroy to question the bizarre division is something I've been doing for forever when we started Revinoir, we produced music we, we showed the uh, we did an issue dedicated to kitchen and to taste. We did architecture, fashion, etc. And when I did uh, Africa Remix, there was a jukebox we produced there. There was a library, etc. And yes, because again, this I we're talking about, uh, am I going to wear a jacket that was not fit for me? Or am I going to tailor it? And I, I made a funny film one day. It was just a, a pied de nez I wanted to do. It was called Aristotle's Plot. And uh, uh, what I said in the movie basically was that uh, cinema was invented in Africa 2000 years BC. And what I meant was that any uh, ceremony, traditional ceremony, was a film. The only thing that was missing was the film itself, but you had a text, you had a choreography, you have costumes, you had uh, art, and you had, uh, I mean, you had everything there, music, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of a sudden, people decide to cut, because again, you want to enter by the, the little door, because you think this is what it is. Um, anywhere I am, when somebody tells me I'm an artist, I ask him, what is your discipline? Because I know that when he says I'm an artist, he means I'm a painter or a, a sculptor, etc., etc. And I would tell him, a guitarist or a composer is an artist too. So don't just say I'm an artist, thinking that it's obvious that if you're an artist, you're dealing with visual arts. And I think it, it's a lot, and we see it, uh, we see it coming. I mean, Sammy, our young, uh, our young friend, he did things with a choreographer. Sammy Bologi with a choreographer, with, with uh, musicians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Everybody, I mean, the smarter, are understanding that uh, to be locked in the frame of something that you didn't even invent is very, very limiting. It limitates you. You, 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 you spread. I mean, uh, writing is is, is is crucial. Music is crucial, and I think that yeah. To, to break the boundary of those bazaar that were created for whatever reason. You have theater, you have sculpture, you have blah, 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 blah. And I mean, everywhere it's happening. You, you, you don't have a ballet without a backdrop that is painted by this. And that was happening in the, in the early uh, 90s. So it should come back. The reflection on what is art should, should, should be reshuffled. Would be that something which we can think about now that uh, there are so many new museums going to be built. And uh, sadly enough, they are going to be built. And then comes the reflection, what are we going to do with it sometimes, right? <laughs> yes. The, the last thing you have to do is build a museum. And then, uh, because before you have to think about governance, you have to think about organization. Could that be something that we can event with David Ajed, who is now building the Edo Museum of West African Art, David, most important, I would say, uh, Ghanaian African architect working in Great Britain and the United States, he's also building the Africa Art Institute in Sharjah. Would it be not a good idea to give the message also, hey guys, forget about the Koreans and the Chinese, even if they give a lot of money to build your museums, that you could also come up with a new idea about what a museum of the 21st century is going to be like Jean-Luc Martinez. Uh, I don't know if you like him, the president of the Louvre, he gave at the Nabi Reframing Museums Conference. He was talking in such a, I would say, such a endearing, but very honestly, about Le Musée Imaginaire, the imaginary museum of André Marot for the 21st uh -huh. century. Uh, would that be something when we organize biennials, when we organize 
whatever kind of festivals when we organize exhibitions that we really also think about, hey, let's go back about breaking down these frontiers, these borders between disciplines. Is that something, I know you have been doing it with Renu Noir and the book we just came out about the years of Renu Noir, I think is a fantastic example. Everybody has to buy that book because it's a <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We could give as a message to all these organizers, forget it's not just about buying an object, it's also about producing culture. No, and it's also whenever somebody tells me I need a museum, I would say don't, because the point is not to, to build a museum. I think that if a museum, if a museum would be needed, it would be at the very end of a process. Mm -hmm. We don't start, as you were saying, by building a museum and then say, oh, what are we going to put in there? Who's going to direct it? I mean, a museum is the last. The last, the end of the process. Mm -hmm. And of course, when, when you have been through a process, etc., of thinking, at the end of the day, your museum might even not be a museum mm -hmm. if the reflection is made properly. Because people are always thinking of walls and uh, buildings. Again, I think it's a, a kind of a complex. The other people have been building, we have to build as well. But do we really need to build? I remember a conversation I attended about restitution. And uh, again, my, my question was, did the people ask for those works? And did they ask for them with a good reason? We've been thinking, this is what we want to do with them. Now Mr. Macron gave them back to us. Say no, Macron said, I'm going to give them back to you. And a lot of people were telling me, we're going to build museum, et cetera, et cetera. And my question is, do you know what are those objects? Do you know their history? And do you know that when they were taken from Africa, the borders were not the same? Do you know that there were people who were living together, working together, who belong to different countries now, thanks to the Berlin Conference? Do you know that some people might want to burn those objects? that you would not want to burn them because now they valued millions, et cetera, et cetera. So the job is not done. What are we going to bring back? Are we going to bring back ghosts? Or are we going to bring back all the things, strangers, et cetera, et cetera? But no matter what we bring back, we bring in there what, for what purpose? Are we going to put them in villages? Are we going to create some huts in villages? Are we going to do this? Or are we going to try to make a, a Kebranli in Africa? which would be the most absurd thing. So that's the point. The reflection on it made the museum is not the solution. Mm -hmm. The object is a, the question. What do we do with it? And if we don't, don't catch, question the thing, then, well, we can always build a thing. You, you know, I know. We've seen things that were built and then they, they crashed because there, there was no <laughs> policy. The policy was uh, ending at building the building. And then there was nothing left, no reflection. So th there's so many possibilities. With David that you've mentioned, uh, we did a project once, it's art at work. And I asked him to build uh, a thing. And that thing, we replaced it. We put it in a garden in, in Cairo. We put it in front of a train station in, uh, in Uganda. We put it in a market in, uh, and, and we organized exhibitions there mm -hmm. to see how people will react with this that's, object. That's the same, the same kind of thing which I experienced in uh, Wakadugu when yeah. in the years with Christoph Schlingensief and the German yeah. theater opera director and uh, not to forget the Burkinabi yeah, architect. Is this a museum? Is it a village? Is it a school? I mean, it could be everything at once. Yeah. And that's something I can see happening in Sharjah, yes, because uh, Hor al Kazimi just organized the film festival. We know she's producing performance. She gets definitely into other uh, terrains. Now the research terrain with the Africa Art Institute uh, trying to distribute and to enhance and reinforce the legacy of Okrian Wazer. So this would be definitely a chance also to do. And I know that when artists like Yinka Shonibar, RK Hindi Wiley are creating their production centers in Africa, their residencies, 
I, I think it just needs a little bit of a push and, and things can also take there this aspect of the future, of futurism. But you need to be, uh, you need to be in a group of people. And is also that like what you did with Le Vieux Noir, what you did with NKA, with Salah Hassan yeah. uh, and Okwi, that, that we have to put things together again, that, we, that I see in Africa right now, things are way too dispersed. There is no like a group formation of people who want to you know, put their fist on the table and say, listen to us. I mean, and that's something which is, I think, quite necessary and it should not be organized anymore from the diaspora like the Revue Noir, it should be organized in Africa itself. And that's something which is uh, more than ever necessary to also to rethink the taboo of the difference between economy and capital. When I spoke to Kerry James Marshall in 2017, he made it so clear to me when I was asking him, you know, what we need to do. And he said, we want to have museums in the United States where we are the directors, we are the curators, we are the artists, we are the trustees. Because he said the difference between economy is the difference between Beyoncé and really cultural capital. He said Beyoncé has money, but there is no capital. And from capital, you can build. Yeah. And, and so that's, that would be, I think, if we do something in terms of the legacy of Okwian Ways or in, the, in terms of the legacy of Syndica Dokolo, <laughs> then it could be that. And I think that's more important than to have a pavilion in Venice or whatever. Who cares about a pavilion in Venice? Um, we had a project that was to, I mean, inspired probably by the talented 10 of Du Bois, but it was to find uh, 10 uh, young African entrepreneurs and ask them to put 1 million in a basket every year. So that there would be a foundation based in Africa uh, with African trustees, but not necessarily. I don't believe in the whole Africa thing. I take people who think, etc. Whether they're Africans or not, doesn't what it's not what matters the most. But to have this instrument that would be able to leverage. You want to do this as this foundation, so 10 people, uh, a million per year, it would be, it would mean that foundation have, have 10 millions. And yeah, I mean, let us, let's face it, that uh, we can talk about the voice, about the thing, about thing. it goes down to economy, as long as there's not a solid economy invested in, in art, there won't be, because as long as there's no market in Africa, African art, quote unquote, we talked about it, won't exist because it will depend on whatever market decides. I remember when I opened the first uh, Johannesburg Art Fair, I told to the guys there, you're complaining now because of all the treasure, all the memory that was stolen from you. I said, now it's your responsibility. If you don't buy, now come to me in the century saying, oh, all our things are the Tate Modern are in Pompidou because now it's your job. And I think that the most, and this is why um, uh, Syndica role is so critical. What we need the most is money. I mean, let's face it, that I, what an artist would say, Simon, you know, how much is you now? I, I'm not, come on. They have to eat, they have to buy the painting, they have to. So there's certain hypocrisy about uh, every artist wants to be uh, uh, Van Gogh. I don't think every artist wants to be Van Gogh. The guy killed himself, got crazy, cut an ear. So if we want to have a sustainable system, we, we need to have an economical system that can dictate uh, or that can provide uh, the, 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 the policy of all this. And if there's nothing, in Africa, nothing will happen. We can build whatever we want, as you were saying, mentioning the, the diaspora. We can do whatever we want outside of it. If nothing is happening in Africa, it's not going to, it's not going to flare. Yeah. Let's see if there are some questions. I mean, is there some, are there some questions? Is our, um, uh, moderator somewhere. I mean, uh, we are. I'm. 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 I'm looking up some questions. Let me see. If there are some questions. 
No, there are no questions. So we, we can go on. We can go on. There are no questions. Perfect. Then we can go on. Fantastic. So in, in terms of uh, the Gulf, what I, what I think is interesting and the discussion I had with Salah Hassan of the Africa Art Institute was for me very enlightening. I think there is a unique chance in Sharjah, Dubai and Abu Dhabi to do something which is really based on this va-et-vient between Africa and the Gulf, but also uh, dealing with these issues of Afro uh, uh, Arabism, because uh, when, I mean, one of the, the, the issues I came up with at Tate Modern when we try to write the Africa strategy is again that question about what is, uh, for God's sake, Africa, because are we going to take on artists like Rashid Qureshi, are we taking on artists like Susan Efuna, or do we have to create a Middle Eastern uh, strategic group or uh, buying committee? And uh, I mean, so there is also that question because I see many links between, for instance, the work of and, and, and Konate uh, in uh, Mali. You know, I see many links, which, which could be fantastic to bring these links together. How do you see that? Did you have any discussions about this where you are right now in Doha? Or uh, did you have any discussions uh, about this in, 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 in the Gulf? No, I mean, I, I had discussions about this in, uh, in, in Cairo, in Dubai, uh, Abu Dhabi, I had, I, I'm going to have them here because I think that there's, a, there's an obvious junction and that it was about time that both sides realized that uh, it was the perfect position, not in the center, quote unquote, but right where it should be and uh, where it could be efficient. Why we're not dealing uh, politics, we're not dealing past, we're dealing again future. It's like, how do we move from here to the day after? Where there's no, you know, you're my master, I used to be your slave, etc. Cetera, et cetera. The, the, the relationship are cleaned of all sorts of uh, stain of, uh, of history and can, can move. And the thing is already there. When, um, when I did Africa Remix, a, a brilliant. Uh, a uh, French critic came to me and said, well, Mr. Njami, you're putting things upside down. You invited some Egyptian artists, some Tunisian, some Moroccan. I told him, well, I'm sorry. You seem to be very brilliant, but just look at the map of Africa. And that was the end of the conversation. But I think that is this, this horn we have there in Ethiopia, that antelect is, uh, is is that is entering in a dialogue with, with the Middle East. I mean, Egypt is there and at the same time there. So there is this, this position that a discussion must, uh, must be uh, nourished and might become rich and might become uh, fundamental because this is a way to recreate, I hate the term center, but to diffuse another, uh, another place it's a place, another location from which another reflection can take place. I don't think people can think uh, seriously about, let's say, colonization or whatever in Paris, because all the tools are dealing with or are contradictory or whatever. If you take a little distance, there's a lot of things that, that can be addressed. And I think, as I said earlier, as a plane, as I said earlier, that there's a lot in common in uh, renegotiating what is an identity, in renegotiating modernity, uh, and see how how you change without changing, how you yourself, you're an individual, and how do you enter uh, the day after without losing too much from the past. I mean, these are issues that they, they have in common so, so, so badly and so strongly. I, I, I need some advice, Simon, because uh, we spoke uh, in the beginning about all these different movements and key ideas which floated by, which are dealt with. They are kind of digested, they are uh, deconstructed, they are looked at in depth or superficial, whatever. And we see more coming by, uh, all a kind of illustration about that, uh, of that catchphrase, which I still find important from Okrian ways or by Okrian ways or thinking historically in the present. I need some advice from you because we are working here in Paris at the Grand Palais at a critical 
reconstruction of the first African exhibition at the Grand mm -hmm. Palais in 1966, an idea of Leopold Sangar and André Marot, critically reconstructing, that is also looking back at all these movements, la negritude, pan-Africanism and so forth. I know that uh, Sharjah is working in 2022 on an exhibition, the second, the sequel to the post-war exhibition of Opry called Post-Colonialism. Uh, also probably uh, critically reconstructing because they are commissioned contemporary artists. That's exactly the same we do. Does it still make sense to make these kind of exhibitions to go back and, and think about where it all comes from? Or should we give up these exhibitions trying to explore the recent past to give us a kind of you know, backbone to, to work from, uh, or should we forget these exhibitions? Uh, it's a serious question because, I, I, I mean, I, I, sometimes I wonder, should I do something else? No, I mean, it's a serious question. I'm giving a serious answer. The, those exhibitions should be forgotten physically, but not intellectually. I, I don't see the point. It, it's just like when, of course, it was a catastrophe and you, you know better than that. It's like, but the volunteer, it was the will of the president Wad to redo the 66 Pan African festival that happened in the car. Uh, and it just had no sense. But the idea of Sangor was the only thing that could have survived, but to reproduce what happened before under different conditions. I mean, what was wonderful in 66 in Dakar was that Duke Ellington was there, that uh, a bunch of people were there, they're not there anymore. Who, who's, where's Duke Ellington? And what's the point of bringing Beyonce because Duke Ellington's not there? And it was another time, uh, 66, uh, Africa uh, in America, they were just getting out of the ghetto and there were a lot to fight still. Two years later, Martin Luther King would be killed. A year before, Malcolm X was killed, et cetera, et cetera. This negritude thing, et cetera, et cetera, made sense. But now, what would be the translation? This is what I would be interested in. What would be the new movement? Uh, what would it be? How would it be look like? And this is what would inspire me. And this is probably, this, uh, I wrote when I said, when, when we said the day after, is because uh, in Africa, at least in the Basa people I come from, there's no tomorrow nor yesterday. There's always today. So there's the day before today and the day after today. But what people don't understand say, oh, you're living in the immediacy. Say, no, today uncomprise what happened yesterday and the day after and the day after. If not, today would not exist. So the today is not just this, it's the result of whatever happened. And I think that what's interesting in those exhibitions is, is the today. Mm -hmm. Noting that today is seeking for the day after and is the result of of the days before, but to try to reenact the day before them. Um, Thank I you for the advice. All true, all true, but there is still the issue of amnesia. Uh, when I look at what's happening in Saudi Arabia, or the Gulf for that matter, uh, or the collection in Doha of Mataf, I see also there are very important initiatives to speak about Arab modernism because we don't know what it is. So there is still the issue of amnesia. Are, are you just saying, forget about it, it is forgotten, uh, probably it's not dealt with, look at today in order to look to tomorrow. So you don't have issues with amnesia, for instance, you're a specialist in terms of African photography, and I still don't think that we know the true history of African photography. Is it worthwhile to concentrate on that? It's a question for museums, it's a question for curators, because you know that today curators, even of biennials, the nostalgia, nostalgia, the romantic nostalgia for the archive uh, is, is, is there. At the same time, it is important to, to talk about amnesia, isn't it? Yes, but for me, this is history. And I know that how uh, important history is. I started, I did a project called Amnesia, and I started in, in Nairobi some years ago. But I think that 
museum, historical museum. We don't have a historical museum in Africa, for instance. I think that this is something interesting uh, to build an historical museum that doesn't deal with dead history, but that deal with living history. And for me, what happened in 66 is living history, but it is history. And it has to be addressed in in different perspective and different places with different, uh, how could I say, ambitions. Yes, one of the, the greatest plague uh, uh, in a lot of places in the world is amnesia, is whether created amnesia or, or desired amnesia not to know. And of course, how can you define again where you're going if you don't have any idea of where you're coming from. And when I mean when you're coming from, not like those basic Afrocentrists who want to know they were Bantu, ba ba bi, ba ba ba. Where you're coming from is informed by the history that build the, the, the way you're coming from. You cannot just look of you, trace your roots, like in this <clears throat> a bit stupid books of uh, Alex Alley, uh, Roots, where the guys are uh, Kunta Kinte, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm Kunta Kinte, so what? If you don't know what what has been happening between here and there, if you can't fill the gap, what will be the interest of knowing that you, you were uh, a Malian from Timbuktu uh, 500 years ago? Uh, what is interesting is the storytelling. When is storytelling? And uh, and I consider history uh, as a storytelling, and I don't hear much of that storytelling coming from certain region of the world. And when they were trained like this, I mean, we're in the Middle East, they were the best storytellers ever in Africa, the best storytellers ever. But I, I don't hear I don't hear those stories. History can be a story when it's properly told. Nothing. <laughs> Yes, I mean, photography is exactly the, the, I mean, photography has the illusion of, of reality, has the illusion of being an archive. But I think that uh, it's again about uh, storytelling. We, we need to invent a, a new way of addressing things. Uh, you know, I, I did this uh, uh, research when I was a kid about a guy who wrote this story is true from beginning to end because I invented it from beginning to end. I think that it's time for people to reinvest. We don't have information, we create them, at least from a piece of, a, of film that is a photography. We can invent a lot of things. I, I made a conference with an archive I found of a Russian Jewish family in Ukraine in the 30s, and there was a black woman there so I made a conference saying I didn't know that my uh, grand grandmother was servant in a Jewish family in Ukraine. But everybody bought the story I told them. At the end of the conference, I said, sorry, I don't know that woman. It's not my grandmother. The only thing she has is that she's a black woman. But I told the whole story that they, they could buy. I think people, that's why it's specialities now, photography, this, this and that. That's why when we did some uh, photography anthology, I asked a lot of writers, fiction writers, to select an image and to tell me about the image. What we need, I guess, we will always have history. What we need is to, to build more stories around that history. The history is there, historian will dig. But I think that our work, uh, curators, artists, etc., is to use a certain material and to tell stories, and tell stories that were never told in a language that was never used. With and stories um, which matter for the future, for today. Absolutely. absolutely, stories like passages from now to tomorrow. That, that's, uh, yeah. We need stories, I think. We need more stories. Is that, a, is, that a, is, that a, is that a nice way to end this conversation? We need yes. more stories I think, uh, I think, because we want to talk about tomorrow. Could that be a good I, thing? Yes. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a day because we have to think about tomorrow. Absolutely. Yeah, the day after, this is what matters. Today is already gone. It was a great pleasure. Maybe, but maybe, Simon, 2020 did not even exist. That's the point. 
post 2020 exist or not that's that's something maybe tomorrow or the day after tomorrow we'll have to think about it we will find out if we really existed in 2020 yes so <laughs> so much thank you abu dhabi art for giving me the opportunity to be able to converse with my good friend simon and uh, i'm i really thank you simon again we should do this no I and I thank you a lot too. And, and I was just thinking of something positive. If 2020 didn't exist, it will mean next year that we're one year younger than what we think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's open perspective. And, and you and I, we will see each other again on December 7th because then we are absolutely. talking about Sami Balocci. And if it still makes sense to make public monuments or to destroy them, right? That's what we're going yeah. to talk about. Okay, Absolutely. December 7, live from Paris. Thank you so much. <laughs> live from Doha. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.